Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. My spouse likes to begin his day with a good attitude, and so he um, starts out with the funny pages, the comic strips um, that are in the Star Tribune, and one of his favorites is Baby Blues. And so he was showing me this one the other morning. Baby says, my friend Dakota's family is vegan. Dad answers, that's nice. Baby says, I think we should be vegans too. Dad says, okay, but you'll have to give up hamburgers and pepperoni pizza. Baby says, in that case, let's just stick with whatever religion we are now. <laughs> the word religion literally means to be bound, to be tied. Some everyday choices are tied to our family's beliefs. And we know in the church, as Ella so par uh, powerfully reminded us this morning, that in the church we have more than our biological families shaping our beliefs. We also have our faith family. Family is a set of relationships grounded in mutual love and respect. That is kind of the overall theme of today's lessons. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your enemy. Know how loved you are by God. Family is a set of relationships, and our relationships in the family of faith are based on God's loving relationship with us and our relationship with God, our relationship with each other within the family of faith, and then our relationships with those others, the stranger, the outsider, and even the enemy. Today's scripture readings help us see how we're called to live in a healthy way through these relationships. In our reading from Leviticus, we learn that together as God's people, we are to be holy like God is holy. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear I'm supposed to be holy, that's kind of scary, right? It's really hard for me to understand what does that mean because I'm certainly an imperfect person, and I assume that most of you are. So what does it mean? We are called, the scriptures tell us, to be a reflection of God's holy purposes. And that's what's meant when in Genesis 1, we read that God creates humans in his image and likeness. We're not God, but we're the image, the likeness of God. And our human lives are meant to reflect God's love to the world. Think about that a minute. When God saw everything that God had made, when God looked at the world, he saw that it was very good. He loved it. The holy God sees the goodness, the wholeness, and the set of healthy relationships between everything in the world that he made. God's world is holy. When you get up in the morning, are you seeing that? When you look in the mirror, what do you see? Are you seeing the best in yourself? And then when you go out the door, are you seeing the best in your neighbors? And when you run into a stranger in the supermarket, are you seeing the best in that person? And even a coworker that's grated on your nerves, are you seeing the best in them? Do you find it difficult to see yourself or this congregation as holy. When you hear those words, love your neighbor as yourself, do you find self-love kind of difficult? I know I do. I had one of those very proper mothers who spent a lot of time trying to improve me. And so, you know, just there's kind of an eternal mother tape in my head. My mother has been, God bless her, she did a wonderful job in many ways, been, been gone for 15 years. But I still hear her. Any of you have this experience? And it's usually in a corrective tone. Something like, what do you think you're doing? <laughs> or are you, do, are you really going to leave the house looking like that? Do you find self-love difficult? Or are you like me in those moments, preaching to yourself the anti-gospel, the not-so-good news to yourself? Say, you know, I'm not really quite good enough. 
I'm not really worthy. Then you need, along with me, to hear the good news from 1 Corinthians today where Paul writes this. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? In other words, God has made you worthy. You are the beloved child of God, we're told in our baptism. Jesus doesn't promise us a new and improved product to whiten our teeth that's going to make me look better to myself in the mirror and help you win the admiration of your neighbor so they'll love you back. No, Jesus brings the new covenant of love written on our hearts, not an outside job, but an inside job that erases all those negative old tapes. The cross, you know, is that big plus sign that goes right through all that negativity. And St. Paul writes about this in our text from Corinthians, this inside job. Do you not know that you are God's temple and God's spirit dwells in you? You're holy. Think of this beautiful temple. It's such a gift to worship here, isn't it? One that's been really given to you in many ways because none of us living here put these windows in, right? So, you know, they're a true blessing. It's so beautiful, this temple. But you wouldn't dream of, you know, bringing the flowers on the altar, bringing old dead flowers, would you? You wouldn't bring, dream of bringing your, your garbage from home that you forgot to set out on Tuesday or Wednesday and dumping it up here on the carpet, would you? And you wouldn't dream of taking that bulletin cover where it says First Lutheran Church and printing on the bottom, this church is ugly. Of course not. So why do so many of us insist on carrying in our hearts and even in our conversations in our churches bouquets of drooping past disappointments, old garbage of past hurts and resentments, and negative self-talk about ourselves, our families, or our churches? Good news. Jesus has brought an end to this. You are God's temple. And God's spirit dwells in you individually and as a church. God has declared you whole, healthy, and holy. God's beloved beginning in your baptism and continuing to this very moment. As the 12-step groups like to say, God doesn't make junk. We are God's holy temple, not the place for junk beliefs about ourselves or others or even junk food of any kind. The parish nurse who encourages people on the path of health and wholeness reminds us that our body is a temple of God's spirit to be cared for and honored and respected. Our bodies are in a relationship with God. We're reminded of that at this time of the year so powerfully because we begin this time of the year with Christmas. It's Christmas and Epiphany together. It's God coming in a body. In Jesus, God lived in a body. And in the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus' love lives in your body. Our bodies are in a relationship with God. We are connected to heaven, but we are also very much on earth and of earth. Adam, the word comes from Adama, the soil in Hebrew. God shaped Adam from the soil and put him in a garden to care for the soil out of which he came. His health, his wholeness depended on the garden. The garden gave him what he needed, and he was in right relationship with the earth, the creation, and then he was in right relationship with his helping partner, Eve, and he was with him, in right relationship with himself and his purpose, and with God, his creator. This was the original holiness, the original wholeness. But we know something distorted that relationship. It was a human choice, freely made, but a destructive choice that I think the fundamental thing to understand about is it denied human limits. Think about it. Eating the fruit is a metaphor for greediness, for over-consuming in a land of abundance. 
Think about where we live and how, how many different restaurants. You know, you can eat Chinese in Red Wing and you can eat Mexican and you can eat at Applebee's and you can go to, you know, any food that you want at any time of the day, pretty much, right? We live in this land of abundance. What happens when you go to the table of abundance at a smorgasbord or at a buffet? How many of us overeat? Yeah, right? We act as though there's no limits because it's so abundant. So eating the fruit, one thing it was, was a metaphor for greediness, for over-consuming in a land of abundance, for overeating and taking more for ourselves, for disrespecting human limit limitations. Ever think that God might have been saying, put the fork down? What are the results of that transgression, of that greediness, of wanting, of understanding divine power? Because remember, they talk about going to be like gods, of understanding divine power as I can have as much as I want, whenever I want, however I want. There are no limits to God, and so I'll be like God. And of course, we know God isn't like that at all. God chooses to limit God's self and even pour God's self out in Jesus. But what are the results of the transgression of that denial of human limitation, blaming others, feeling shame and guilt, and enduring exile? It's a story we all know, not just because it's in the Bible, but because we repeat it in our individual lives and in our life together. But good news, this is a cycle we are freed from through the work of Christ and his spirit of love. Through Christ and his spirit of love, we learn to love ourselves, partially as we receive the love from our congregation. We're loved by God and one another and learn to love ourselves because we're loved by God who lives in and among us. Right relationship is established through Christ through his wholeness and holiness. And it comes through his sacrifice on the cross, a free sacrifice, a free giving of himself that's really a sacrifice of the human ego, a transforming of that self-serving choice that the first Adam made to have it all and sacrifice nothing, give up nothing. It's a reversal of that choice by Christ, which the scriptures call the second Adam. What do I mean a sacrifice of the ego? The ego wants power to be king or queen of everyone, to own and possess everything and satisfy every desire. In a couple weeks, we'll hear again how Jesus had to deal with that. At the very, as his ministry was about ready to start, was his ministry going to be about himself? Was it going to be about how much power he had, how much applause he could get? And the tempter, the devil, gets at him in the wilderness and tests his ego, saying, so then, you want to rule the world? You can. So then, you want to have applause from a, and approval from everybody? Make sure everybody gets fed. Turn these stones to bread. You want people to believe that you really sent God's son? Leap from tall buildings unhurt. That's meeting that ego need. And what does Jesus respond? He'll quote God's word and trust in the truth of God's intention for his human life. He'll give up his rule by his ego. When I want to be right, when I want to be the one that wins the argument and gets the most attention and approval, that's living from the ego. It divides the world between me and you, between us and them. And that's why Jesus challenges us to love the opposition, to love even the enemy, to see the other. If you're a Republican, to see the DFL or in God's image. If you are a, a DFL or to see the Republicans in God's image. Oh, scary thoughts. Right. It's why Moses is told to tell the people Leave the grain at the edges of the fields for the alien and the poor. You might not like them, but you're called to love them because this is the sacrifice of your ego of having all the profits for yourself and all the food for yourself. 
And then we're really called to join Jesus praying for his enemies from his cross so that love will end up being stronger than death. Those things that actually kill God's spirit within us. Think about how corrosive hatred becomes. Have you ever worked in a workplace where people have somebody they love to hate in the workplace? They'll identify somebody that's annoying. Their behavior is annoying. And they'll start gossiping about that person around the water cooler. Did you see what she did today? Did you hear what she said today? I can't believe it. And then gradually there's this little unity of hatred and negativity and everybody starts getting more suspicious and more blaming. And this corrosive atmosphere begins to make everybody feel more and more tired. Huh. Curious thing about that. Have more and more upset stomachs. Curious thing about that. On the inside job where the place where love is supposed to be filling the hearts of people, instead, hatred of the enemy begins to do its corrosive work, if you will. It's the bringing of the garbage into the temple of our bodies. So loving the enemy, this kind of holy love, loving our neighbor as ourself, does it sound too hard? Does sacrificial living just sound like such a big thing? Well, maybe we need to get it down to something really simple. I've just gotten done reading a book called Food and Faith, A Theology of Eating by Professor Norman Wurzba of Duke University. And he writes about his grandpa and what his grandpa did with his chickens. For grandpa, chickens were first and foremost God's creatures. They were never meant to be tormented or abused, but cared for in ways that facilitated the fulfillment of their natures. As the farmer charged with their care, he did not think it was enough to make sure they were well fed and housed. It also mattered to him that they experienced forms of delight suitable for a chicken. On summer days, he would therefore take his scythe and a bucket and cut fresh grass for them. As he approached the chickens, they came running, clearly excited about the grass offering they were about to receive. As they ate, my grandfather grinned and chuckled, clearly delighted that he had contributed to their pleasure. The fact my grandfather daily took the time to make that offering shows that we live by the gifts and sacrifices of others. When he sat down to eat these chickens, he could be thankful in ways that few of us can because he knew that he had first given himself to them. His daily work was a form of worship because it was a lifting up of God's gifts so that they might be properly received and cared for. The taste of his chickens, in turn, was deep because it included the memory of good work, the experience of mutual delight, the knowledge of a hospitable and gracious God, and the pain and joy of sharing in the lives of others. Wurzba concludes, to receive food as God's gift is an extraordinarily difficult thing to do. Our perennial temptation is to want to possess and control. And if you don't believe that, read the books or see the films about the terrible conditions of animals on factory farms raised to get them to be as fat, weighty, and uh, cheaply produced as possible without caring for their well-being. Holiness involves a relationship with everything on the planet even the food. Holiness involves a relationship with food that is not gluttonous and not selfish. It involves a relationship that means we're aware of the food we serve, where it comes from, how the animals and soil are treated, how healthy it is for us, and how we provide for the hungry. The food pantries are going to be busy this next month of March in Minnesota here with Minnesota Food Share. And as a mission of the church, it has its roots here leaving enough food on the edges of our field so we don't consume it all, so there's some of it left on the table for the poor and the stranger. That's written right into God's code, God's program for the well-being of life and community, for our wholeness, our holiness, together. Right now, the Southeast Minnesota Synod has an emphasis with our new bishop on ending hunger in Minnesota. Why? 
It's programmed into the DNA of God's people to do this. It's the holiness code for the whole and healthy people of God. Does this way of life and relationship with God, with each other, and with the creation, does this holy way ever seem too hard? Sometimes, you know, I get tired. I just want to watch one of those really silly, syrupy movies that makes me feel good. So I was sitting there the other night with our German exchange student that we're privileged to have for three months. She's moved on to her new family now. We were watching one of those happy ever after movies and it got to the end as the couple's driving off into the sunset, arm in arm as they do, you know. And, and I turned to her and said, and they lived happily ever after. And she said, is that what you say in English? She said, we say, and if they're not dead, they're still alive. <laughs> and I said, what? Talk about Nordic doom and gloom. And we both laughed. But in a way, this fits with a realistic awareness of how death is part of life. How that grass gives up its life to feed the chickens. How the chickens give up their life to feed the humans. How Jesus gives up his life so that we might have life eternal. The death of the ego, death to sin, we're alive in Christ. We have choices to make all the time, food to buy or not, people to meet or not, work to do or not. Are these choices informed by God's spirit, the spirit of love that makes us reflect God's love for each other and for his creation? We're coming to the end of the season of Epiphany. It's my favorite season of the church. I just love it because it's about light. It's about the light that comes from the heavens, it's about the Son of God. It starts with that bright light of the star and those strange, mysterious, wise guys from the east, the foreigners, sh trying to find their way to this king that they really don't know much about. It's this wonderful mystery of seeing the world through God's eyes where all are welcome, all are holy, all are beloved. Thanks be to God for loving us and continuing to shape us into God's holy people. Amen. <laughs>